Hi everyone, I'm Rich Lucy. I am a Senior Prevention Program Manager here at the Drug Enforcement Administration in our Community Outreach and Prevention Support section. And welcome to this episode of Prevention Profiles, Take 5. Very excited about today's guest, uh, especially uh, we don't get very many state prevention directors on our podcast. Uh, I think we've only had maybe one other before Beverly. Uh, Beverly Johnson is our guest, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, and then we'll get into our interview. So Beverly Johnson is the Director of Prevention Services for Alabama's Department of Mental Health. And in this role, she manages all prevention services for the Division of Mental Health and Substance Use Services, serves as the state representative to the National Prevention Network, and serves as the Vice President of External Affairs on the Executive Committee of the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors. In addition, Beverly manages the prevention component of the Substance Use Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery Services Block Grant and serves as the liaison for the state's 67 counties, community mental health boards, nonprofit organizations, community coalitions, schools, and freestanding entities. Beverly is a substance abuse prevention skills trainer, and she's received training in mental health first aid, question, persuade, refer, and assessing and managing suicide risk. And with that, Beverly, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Rich. I really appreciate being here. Absolutely. And uh, there's going to be some exciting news coming out of Alabama later this year at the end of the podcast. I'd like to talk about that event that's going to be coming to your state in, in August a little bit. Um, but let's get started right in on the interview. So people who know me have, have watched the podcast or listened to it, know my bio. They know that I started my career overseeing the higher ed initiatives for the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. And I know that it has gone a name change uh, over the last couple of years. And throughout my career at the state and federal government levels, I've heard from campus-based professionals who have had difficulty engaging their state agency that deals with drug misuse prevention. So what advice do you have for our viewers who struggle with this and are trying to engage their state agency? Well, thanks, Rich. That, that, that's a great question. I, I think that the first thing um, that I would do is connect with my state prevention representative. Um, I, I think it, it's beneficial to know that uh, each state territory has a national prevention network representative or a person that is responsible for prevention services uh, that is within your state or territory. Uh, connecting with that necessary individual um, to ensure that you're able to obtain the necessary resources uh, and to establish the necessary coordination and collaboration uh, will be key. Um, in addition, when we're talking about higher education and higher education partnerships, um, students in college is a category of priority and focus. Um, so having that access to that key individual that is within your state that is responsible for the prevention services in your state uh, to focus on this particular priority population will be beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And I know uh, from my time when I, before I came to work at, at DEA, I used to work at SAMHSA in, in CSAP, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention specifically. And I know that the state's receive grants. I mentioned it in your bio. So I, just off the top of my head, first of all, the substance abuse block grant and the partnerships for success grants are a couple that I were familiar with. They're both opportunities there for colleges and universities to, to leverage and connect with their state, right? Absolutely. And, and as I mentioned, when I, when I spoke about the students in, co in um, college and being a priority population, that is one of the um, priority populations that is categorized within the substance use prevention treatment and recovery services block grant. Um, mm -hmm. So that is an opportunity for individuals to be able to establish that necessary coordination to be able to reach and expand um, service implementation with, with that particular population. That's great advice. And for our viewers, I'd also want to mention our website, campusdrugprevention.gov. If you go to the resources section of the website and click on state and local, you'll see the interactive map that we have there. And just click on your state and you'll get the contact information for your national prevention network representative, because that's what we are trying to do is help 
you know, leverage and make those contacts, you know, for you uh, at both the state level and the local level. So, you know, very happy to have that advice uh, from you, uh, Beverly. And, you know, I, I've, I've said this before uh, on other, you know, occasions, you know, my mentor, uh, Fran Harding, who I know you know as well, you know, she used to say, don't wait to be invited to the table. Sometimes you have to invite yourself, right? And so sometimes it takes several knocks on the door, uh, you know, to be invited to the table, but you, you, need, you need to make that little bit of effort as well. And hopefully the states are receptive. I know sometimes the states are kind of focused on K-12 and maybe, you know, youth under the age of 17. But as you said, we know that age group, 18 to 25, uh, those young adults have some of the highest rates of, of drug use. And so we need to focus in on that population. Sure. Yeah, and also, Rich, what I would like to, to add also, if, if your state and or territory has a higher education partnership, um, that may also be your connection point uh, to be able to establish that connection between your state representative as well as your college and university. Oh, great. Great advice. Thank you for that. So as I move on to our, our next question, uh, um, a lot of my interviews, uh, there's a question in there usually about the SPIF. The strategic prevention framework, which we all know and love for for good reason, over the last you know quarter of a century plus, it has been a a trusted guardrail, right, for for all the planning and implementation and evaluation of programming. And we know that one of the foundations, the underlying foundations of the SPIF, is cultural competence, and sustainability is the other foundation. Certainly, since 2020. Issues surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion have rightfully taken a front seat in national conversations on just about every topic. So how does a state agency like yours help to support local communities, especially communities of color, in their efforts to prevent drug use? That's, that's another great question. Um, as, as we're talking about higher education and partnerships with higher education, I would like to utilize one example that we have with our historically black colleges and universities that are within the great. state. Um, you know, within the state of Alabama, we currently have uh, eight four-year uh, HBCUs uh, that are within the state. Um, we've been able to, to utilize funds um, through our provider network to be able to provide uh, prevention services um, with our HBCUs. Um, we've been able to um, capture a needs assessment to be able to determine what the needs are from the lens of the student, from the lens of the faculty, and from the lens of the staff, um, as well as the surrounding community to ensure that these students have the necessary um, resources and access to services. And not only that, but to be able to meaningfully engage uh, the students to be able to understand what their needs are. So understanding that we have um, priority areas that we focus on as a state, but we also want to have the engagement of the student population so that we have a real understanding of you know, what services are needed um, and how we can provide those services in a culturally relevant manner where we're having that meaningful engagement of outreach, education, and awareness. That's great. And I am so glad you mentioned the, the HBCUs. As I was doing my own research, and I don't know that I had the exact number right, I thought it was 14, but Alabama, I think, has the highest concentration of HBCUs in the nation. Is that right? Yeah. And, and I, when I mentioned the eight, the eight are a four-year university. Right, right. right. So our, our current concentration. However, you know, we are expanding our um, scope of focus um, to incorporate um, our two-year uh, educational institutions as well. That, that's great. And, you know, as I always try to promote the resources that we have available at DEA, over the last couple of years, we have published some supplemental resources to our main strategic planning guide called Prevention with Purpose. And two of those, I think, are very relevant on this topic. One of them is considering culture across the SPIF and, and ensuring that you are doing that. And the other is working with community and technical colleges, because the two-year schools a lot of times are underrepresented, underserved. And I would imagine if you even slice it further that, you know, the two-year HBCUs are probably even more underserved. So that's great that you've got the connection working with them too, Beverly. Absolutely. And so that, that is an area that, that we are looking at um, in expansion. But I also would also like to add that we do have a community college initiative that focuses on two-year um, colleges. 
And so we want to be able to expand what we're currently doing with our four-year HBCUs and be able to expand that into the two-year um, school offerings as well. That's excellent. And for our viewers, so I've already started taking some notes that if you're trying to engage with your state agency, if you have HBCUs in your state and working to develop partnerships with them and at the two-year level, I will definitely help put you in touch with Beverly and her staff because I'm sure they are more than willing to, you know, share the lessons learned because it's, you know, successes and challenges, right, along the way. So um, thank you for that. Um, now, I also want to go to another topic that's top of mind for us at DEA, as it is the rest of the nation, and that's the dangers in, uh, around fentanyl and, and fake pills. Um, in the fall of 2021, we launched our One Pill Can Kill campaign to raise awareness about the dangers of fentanyl, fake pills, including their accessibility and their lethality. And I know Alabama just recently launched a statewide fentanyl awareness campaign. So can you tell our viewers a bit about this new campaign and the messaging that you hope to get across with it? Sure. Um, thank you. The, the campaign uh, that Alabama recently launched is the Odds Are Alabama campaign. Uh, this campaign is devoted to um, bringing forth education, awareness, uh, and promotion efforts as it relates to fentanyl. Um, and whereas we're talking about the odds are, you know, the emphasis is on odds are, um, particularly with this campaign. We have been able to partner with the Alabama Hospital Association, um, the uh, Alabama Medical Association, um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Alabama, um, VITAL, which is a program within the University of Alabama, um, here within the state and others um, to be able to bring forth the education and awareness regarding the odds that, you know, the odds are that if you do not receive um, your medication from your pharmacist or your healthcare provider, the odds are, you know, that fentanyl can be, you know, in, you know, fake pills. And so we want to be able to demonstrate, you know, what those odds are um, of being able to stumble upon, you know, um, something that you may think uh, may be a benefit to you, but perhaps would negatively impact you as a result. And the, the tagline for your campaign is so on point about odds are. Unfortunately, the numbers have been going in the wrong direction, as we would say, um, with a recent public safety alert that we had come out with that showed that there's now been an increase in the number of pills that have been tested with fentanyl. So it was four out of 10 pills that we've tested in our labs with fentanyl contained a, a lethal dose. It's now six out of 10. And as you say, you know, the odds are, you know, not in your favor, not in a good way, right? And um, so the tagline really is appropriate. I mean, what was it like developing that messaging? Did you you know, do the focus group testing and, and all that kind of thing that goes into a campaign? Yes. And so, you know, again, we were able to to partner with, you know, some of our, our partnering agencies. And, and one of the, the benefits um, of this particular partnership is that we were able to partner with our medical professionals, right? And so, you know, for, for um, the medical profession to be able to, um, to tell us, you know, um, up front, what, what some of the things that that they are saying, right? Um, and then also being able to partner with our law enforcement so that we can be able to obtain a perspective from what they are saying, you know, and then of course, being able to apply, you know, that particular information and those particular resources so that we can see that how we can get this information out to individuals within our state so that they are aware of the prevalence you know, of, you know, these fake pills um, and what, you know, may have initially been the intent, but then also seeing what uh, is the actual result. And so Odds Are Alabama is an opportunity for us to be able um, to provide that education and awareness so that individuals are aware that one, that the, the prevalence of fentanyl um, being placed in, in the fake pills and then understanding, you know, that, you know, any type of medication that you're not receiving, you know, from your pharmacist or from your, you know, um, healthcare provider, you know, that the odds are there. And we want you to be aware of what those odds are and so that we can establish a protective mechanism. 
you know, you mentioned the medical professionals, and, and I have, you know, friends and family who are in the law enforcement community, the medical profession. They really do bring a, a unique perspective to this, don't they? I mean, docs and nurses working in the ERs, for example. I, I believe you've had members of, you know, that sector on your team as part of this campaign? Yes. And so, as, as I mentioned, um, we have the medical profession um, that is represented, the hospital association that is represented. We have, you know, representation um, from our insurance company, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, one of our insurance providers. And so, you know, just being able to have those, um, you know, varying perspectives um, to be able to demonstrate, you know, um, the necessity of having this education and awareness campaign uh, has really been beneficial. Um, and so it provides an additional platform for us to, to meet our individuals, our communities, and then also, you know, having our healthcare providers, you know, aware of the prevalence as well. So you mentioned the top line message that's universal. I, I've been saying this all along, no matter what audience we're speaking to, the message of do not take any medicine that's not been prescribed by a licensed provider and dispensed through a trusted pharmacy, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what audience you're talking to. That's a universal message. So I was glad to hear you say that. Um, I was going to ask you a question about youth um, and young adults. We know that they're sometimes they're, well, as long as I've been in the prevention field, it's, it's hard sometimes talking about these issues with youth and young adults because of the invincibility factor, right? That they think that this is not going to happen to me. Are you and your staff and your partners experiencing that to a degree and, and finding a way to break through that with this? Yes, it could, because it really, as you said, the odds are not good on this. Yeah, and so one of, one of the things that we've also been able to do as a state is that we have another campaign also um, that is the My Smart Dose. That mm -hmm. campaign is specifically for um, the population that we're talking about, 18 to 25. And um, this particular campaign demonstrates just that. Um, you know, only take what is prescribed for you. Um, we run a campaign that focuses on, you know, only take those things with, you know, um, that has your name on the label. And that is for that particular, uh, you know, situation, you know, that you're, you're currently in. Um, and so we've engaged um, our 18 to 25 population. We established focus groups. Um, they've been very involved in, um, you know, um, the, the messaging. Um, you know, we uh, established a website. They were even instrumental in, you know, the color palette, you know, and things of that nature. So what, mm -hmm. what is, you know, the messaging and how can we effectively message in order to engage uh, the 18 to 25 population? And so what we were able to do was we were able to obtain um, mm -hmm. college students. Uh, to be able to craft um, the messaging and then also understanding, you know, Rich, that not every 18 to 25 year old is a college student. Um, right. and so we, we were able to um, utilize a platform that we have here within the state because, you know, uh, we're pretty sports driven here. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of that, we were able to utilize some of our fan bases. Um, with our colleges and universities. So whether you're, you know, a student or you're a fan of the university, you still have, you know, access to this particular information. And so that was actually student, a student driven campaign that we continue to utilize that only use what is prescribed, you know, for you. Thank you for mentioning that because we'll make sure that that information is in the show notes. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to link to it as well on our website, campusdrugprevention.gov, as a, as a resource that's available to people. Um, so my next question, I mentioned, you are the Director of Prevention Services for the whole state of Alabama. Um, so what prevention-related issues keep you up at night? I think if I had an issue that would keep me up is um, as we were talking about a little bit with the health disparities and the health equity. Um, within the state, uh, we are primarily a rural state. Uh, mm -hmm. The majority of our state is, is rural. Um, within that, we have quite a bit of unincorporated areas that are within the state. Um, so it's not 
um, unusual for individuals that are within a particular county to have to drive 45 minutes to an hour, you know, to reach the county seat. Um, so we are currently providing prevention services in all 67 counties um, within our state. Um, but one of the things that I, you know, we want to be certain is, is that we are meeting individuals where they are and that we're, you know, having those necessary, you know, touch points where, you know, some of our more rural areas that may be in some of our unincorporated areas that we're meeting them where they are and that mm -hmm. we're providing the necessary resources and access to services. So if I had to, you know, think of something that, you know, that constantly just begins to, you know, you know, go through the thought process of how can we be more, it's just wanted to make sure that we're expanding services and that we're accessible um, to all individuals that are within the state. Absolutely. And um, hopefully you're seeing progress there. I mean, I know the pandemic, as it affected all of us, um, certainly virtual services and telehealth for you know across all walks of life but certainly we've known that for a while right in in the rural populations that accessibility to our services is often a challenge absolutely and one of the things that we've been able to to do to approach that is that our provider network has established disparity impact statements and so what this does is allows us to do a landscape um, of uh, county by county and what our communities look like. So to ensure that, you know, as we are establishing our um, strategic planning for the implementation of prevention services that, you know, that we understand what that landscape looks like. And we want to be ensure that we're able to address the needs of all individuals that are within that county. So we're, we're currently going through, you know, that process to ensure that, you know, that we're, you know, strategically, you know, offering our services so that individuals that are within those areas are appropriately reached. Great, great. Um, so I'm going to throw the bonus question in the interview. Uh, I referenced the event that's coming to, to Birmingham, Alabama. So the National Prevention Network Conference, um, August 15th through the 17th. You've been trying to get it in your state for the last, well, since 2020, right? We were supposed to be there uh, in, in August of 2020. And I think the fourth time is the charm, as we'll say. Um, but you have got to be really excited about, I mean, we normally have about a thousand people or so at this conference. You've got to be really excited about having that many people come into your state uh, for this conference. What, what is it that they can expect uh, when they descend in Birmingham? Yes, and so uh, I'm glad that you brought this up. Yes, this is really exciting. This will be the first conference that we've actually been able to come back face to face uh, since the, the pandemic. So uh, that is that is one thing you know that we're we're looking forward to, and and just looking forward to individuals having the opportunity to experience you know Alabama. Um, so when a part of the focus of this year's conference is looking through the lens of change. Um, so mm. being able to look at those um, aspects of prevention science and what does that look like um, from a lens of change. Um, and so we're excited about the, the opportunity, um, excited for individuals to be able to, to visit the state. Um, this is an excellent platform um, for prevention professionals um, to be able to, to come together to, to get the necessary uh, emerging um, trends as it relates to uh, prevention efforts, uh, prevention science, prevention research, being able to, uh, to, to connect with your peers, you know, in other states and to see what other states are doing. Um, you know, forums such as this um, with our partners, you know, such as DEA, uh, CDC, and others, you know, uh, to be able to, you know, have those discussions, dialogue, and kind of see what things are going on, you know, and so how we can take those things back, you know, to our own states, um, in our own communities, uh, and to be able to effectively provide prevention services. So just excited that, you know, individuals have an opportunity to, to visit Alabama. I'm looking forward to it. And it is going to be a great conference, uh, great offerings. And so uh, just want individuals uh, to register uh, and for the NPN conference and you uh, will have an exciting opportunity. Well, I can hear it in your voice. And I know we're excited uh, to, to get down there uh, for the conference. I mean, just like so many other events, uh, 
Some of them have started to come back to being in person. Uh, and, you know, virtual, that was, you know, the option, and that was fine. But there really is nothing like the in-person conference because it's the personal connections. I, I call them the hallway conversations, right? It's those conversations in between the sessions and, and connecting with somebody over a meal or over coffee where you really do start to discuss, you know, prevention and, and the nitty-gritty. And as you said, it's the research and the science and the programming uh, so, you know, I know you are very excited about having us all down there, and, and we're looking forward to, to being there as well. So the, the, the welcome mat is out. I know that for sure. <laughs> it's the Southern hospitality, right? That's right. <laughs> so as, um, as we wind up the interview, I, I end with the question I ask of all of uh, my guests on the podcast, and that is um, your, your advice and encouragement. What is it that you would say to encourage the professionals who are working to prevent drug misuse among college students, as well as the students themselves who are watching this podcast. What do you have to say for them? Um, as a word of encouragement, I would say um, that you matter. Um, you, you are important. Um, whether you are a prevention practitioner that is actually providing prevention services or whether you're a student that is receiving the prevention services, you know, that, that, you, that you matter. Um, you know, um, your voice, your input, your, your, your feedback, your, your level of engagement. Um, so, you know, it takes a collective effort um, for us um, to be able to effectively provide um, the services in a, you know, culturally relevant manner um, to ensure that we effectively are reaching and meeting the needs of the individuals that we serve. So as we're talking about the higher education, you know, population, you know, there is an expression that that resonates, you know, nothing about us without us, you know, and so, you know, having that level, you know, of engagement, um, you know, is pivotal, you know, for us to be able to effectively, you know, meet the needs. And so, again, you know, whether you're, you know, a professional that is working in the field, you know, whether you're a student that is seeking to work in the field or, you know, want to actively engage students on your college campuses, you know, establish, you know, committees, you know, consortiums, you know, or, or whatever it is that you're doing, just understand that that matters. Um, prevention works. Prevention is effective. And, and so, you know, we want to ensure that, you know, we're able to be that resource you know, to be able to support you in, in the efforts that, that you're doing. That is great words of encouragement. And, you know, I want to throw in a plug for, for self-care here because I know, you know, in our field, in the prevention field especially, and in higher ed community, just like everywhere else, we're wearing a lot of different hats. Um, we're feeling understaffed, under-resourced, um, and, you know, there's the potential for burnout, very quickly in our field at times. And, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, you matter and you are important. Yes, you are. And you need to take care of yourself as well to be effective for others, to be that, you know, caring, empathic, you know, uh, individual for others. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Uh, and, you know, that's really important. And I think it's also important for our viewers to know that, you know, we know that Drug use rates tend to go up following a traumatic event during stressful times. The pandemic, that certainly that whole two and a half plus period. Um, and it wasn't just the pandemic, as I've mentioned before, and we mentioned earlier, it was the civil unrest because of racial injustice. I mean, a lot of that, you know, the microaggressions that people tend to experience and such, all of that can contribute. And it really helps to have people like you in the leadership positions that you're in really being the advocate for prevention because now is not the time to put pre prevention on the back burner, if not off the stove completely, right? I mean, now, now more than ever, prevention is important. So I want to thank you for the work that you do along with the rest of the National Prevention Network representatives because we really need your voice, your leadership. Well, thank you so much, Rich, and, and again, thank you for this opportunity. This has been a, a great opportunity, and I really appreciate you uh, and um, the DEA for everything that, that you do, and so, you know, just want to continue to be, you know, a partner, and any efforts for coordination and collaboration, uh, just know that we're here. 
Well, DEA is just thrilled to have its partnership with the National Prevention Network. So we really appreciate that. Beverly, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. You've had some great uh, words of encouragement, some awesome takeaways, uh, some resources that we're going to pull and, and make sure that we get posted on the website. And uh, I look forward to seeing you down south in August. All right. Looking forward to it. Thanks again. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Prevention Profiles, Take 5. Again, we do this for you. Hopefully you get something out of it. Again, thanks for watching. Have a great day. <laughs>